my name is Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to The Engineering Room, a series of conversations with influential people from our industry. This episode is a little bit different to the usual content on the Continuous Delivery channel. This is an addition to our usual weekly output and it's meant in part as a small Christmas present to our viewers and subscribers and a thank you for your support over the past year. I hope that you're going to enjoy this chat as much as I know that I will. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe. And if, if you, you like it, let us know your thoughts in the comments. Today, I'm going to be talking to a famous software developer about what it takes to deliver genuine excellence in software development and engineering. My guest is actually an old friend of mine. I first met Martin in the late 1990s as a relatively, at least compared to me, young programmer. Uh, he was widely regarded in that organization as something of a star one of the best programmers in a company that was full of very good programmers. Later, we worked together again to build one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges at LMAX. We did many core cool innovative things, winning awards, spinning off successful open source projects and having a lot of fun while doing it. We also created a successful company based on the principles of continuous delivery from day one, a clean room experiment in what is possible. In part, as a result of his work at LMAX and talking about it in public, Martin became more widely known, but mostly that's because he's brilliant. He's now widely seen as one of the top experts in the world on Java, concurrent systems and high performance computing. To me, Martin's simply the best programmer that I've ever worked with. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Martin Thompson. Hi, Martin. Nice to see you and thank you for doing this. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for the very embarrassing introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought it'd be funny to see you blush, given the pale yeah, colour you of your want to skin. Make me squirm. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to tell people a little bit about the kinds of things that you do and the kinds of things that you work on? I know that you can't talk about de specifics in detail because you're 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 a, a commercial uh, asset to your, your to your clients, but but describe a little bit about the kinds of things that you do. Yeah, Dave, like uh, since we last worked together some time ago, uh, we've kind of been doing our own thing. And one of the things that I've been doing is working in the high performance space, helping various companies around the world make their systems faster, more efficient. Though, interestingly, what started out as being mostly about making systems very fast has been morphing over time into making systems more efficient. And probably my time is spent at least half and even more so now on how to make things more efficient and how we do that, because they're basically flip sides of the same problem. So I get to deal with lots of scale and lots of interesting problems, a lot of it in the finance space. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point about efficiency. It's, it's, it's one of my beliefs. So I, I read a New Scientist article some years ago now that, mm. that just talking about the, the, the carbon cost of data centers. And as you and I, no, uh, you know, a, a relatively small improvement in the efficiency of our software can give you orders of magnitude uh, better efficiency in terms of the software that we run. Our software is often, uh, I, I've, I've said in the past, I, I can't think of another field of human activity that's quite as tolerant of waste as, as software. And I know that's something that you care a lot about. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely is. It's kind of fascinating sort of space. I, I, one of the games I often play with some of my customers is when we're profiling in their systems, we play the game of let's find the business logic in the profile. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I, in many, many cases, it's well as 1% of their computing time is spent on their business logic. All the rest is spent in sort of marshalling data on and off the network, making calls, going to databases, sort of doing various crazy things and yeah. generally a good chunk of it logging <laughs> yes yeah yeah that that reminds that reminds me of uh, our first abortive attempt at trying to make the fast system at lmax and when we profiled it we found that we were spending more time deciding where to do work than we were doing work <laughs> <laughs> very common problems <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so one, one of my, in my experience of working with you, you have a great talent for seeing simple solutions in complex problems. Could you paint a picture of that a little bit uh, and your approach to 
career and helping people understand their problems and do a better job. Yeah, I find that kind of fascinating. You know, you're even sort of saying that, and you're not the only one to say that to me, which is quite embarrassing to me in some ways. But it's kind of, I never really thought of it quite like that. And like, how do you even answer that question is an interesting one. I think one of the things that I try not to do is just not be distracted by lots of other things that are going on. And so part of my nature is I want to find the essence of a problem. And I don't want to do a lot of the other crazy things that people seem to want to do in that case. Like we just joked there a second ago about all of the other stuff going on. Well, I think some of it comes down to almost like people are trying to show off or they're trying to show like how bright they are dealing with lots of complexity. I just don't like to do that and never really have. So I want to look at how to solve the problem itself. Like I, I know that you're really into your music and you and I have had discussions over the years and various other things. And like, we've gone to concerts together. And like, when we see great guitar music, I think you and I both appreciate it, but it actually irritates me when I see this sort of self-gratification of people going off <laughs> doing crazy solos. And yeah. I think the same thing happens for me in software. I, I just want to see the problem being solved and people focusing on it. And almost like whenever you do that, it takes away a lot of the rest of the noise and hopefully you come up with a clean solution that just solves the problem. Now, that's a nice analogy. So it's, 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 the, it's the music that matters, not the, not the number of notes per second or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the, the, other, the other aspect of that that was going through my head as you were, you were describing that, uh, your approach is uh, one of the lessons that I know that I learned from you uh, that reinforced something that I, that I believed in a bit, but now I believe in completely is separation of concerns. Mm -hmm. And working, you know, uh, one of the things that I noted when working with closely with you was that whenever you saw um, any sign that a piece of code that you were working on was was trying to do two things, you'd immediately be looking to try and you know refactor the code to try and uh, you know pull out those those differences, those different those different responsibilities. Yeah. I think it's it's probably in my nature at some level. So it's interesting. My thesis was on separation of concerns, and mm -hmm. I guess we end up choosing things like that wasn't really conscious, maybe subconscious, maybe because I'm drawn to those sorts of things. I find it's just so difficult to cope with complexity and get my head around it. I like to generalize. I, I like to work out what's going on. So it's kind of a combination of inductive and deductive reasoning, where you just want to work out why something is the way it is. And as soon as you start conflating things, the complexity goes up as the product of the concerns. And we just can't fit it in our heads. Yeah. I think I've just got comfortable accepting that I have very limited brain capacity. So unless you isolate, you can't really focus in on that. And I see that's something we do well as humans. Like, do you think about just visually taking stuff in or taking stuff in by hearing or whatever? The really important thing that we learn to do in our brains, even when we're young, is filtering. It's to remove mm -hmm. the noise from everything so working out what's important. And separation of concerns is one of the key things that helps us do that because we can focus on one thing at a time. And then you can start looking at how do you assemble things by looking at the interactions between them. And that's a set of concerns in its own right. But you're dealing with things that have got the right level of encapsulation, information hiding, and then look at the protocols beyond that. And it's, basic design at the end of the day. It, it, indeed, I, I, and my new book, if you'll forgive me advertising my new book <laughs> for a minute, but, but my, my, my new book is focused on trying to capture what I think of as the essence of, um, of engineering, you know, the, the, the essence of our craft, the, th the ideas that are transferable between technologies and problem domains and all those kinds mm. of things. And I've come to think of that that collect some of the collection of the, some of the things that you're just referring to as really all focused on managing complexity, and I'm starting to think that maybe that that's all that design is really. De design is about us striving to manage the complexity of the systems that we're and the problems that we're dealing with, so that we can encapsulate parts of the the problem. We can make a change in one place and that we you know leak out to another. And separation of concerns. Uh, as I, I, I picked up from you is um, is one of the the principal tools 
to help you to improve the, the modularity and the cohesion in our code and, mm -hmm. and get those lines of abstraction between different parts of the system and allow us to think, you know, compartmentalize our thinking more. Yeah. And again, coupling cohesion fits exactly with that. When you see coupling that's unnecessary, you want to tease it apart. Some coupling is absolutely necessary and it's realizing what is essential and what's not essential in a design. Same with the cohesion side. It's making sure that things are together that should be together. That helps with change, helps with understanding, helps with all of those things. But we don't seem to really work on refining those skills as an industry. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you just take the time and reflect on some of that, it makes a big difference. And maybe well, it's something that's missing in our training. I, that, that is one of my, my things. And I, I know that you and I have talked, mm -hmm. you know, when we worked closely together, many times about what makes a good software developer and you know bemoaning the kinds of things that 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 you know some you know graduate programs go through and so on and, and teach people at the expense of other things that to us seemed more important those more durable concepts um mm -hmm. i <coughs> It seems to me, it's, I, I've used you as an, I use you as an example all of the times when, I, when I'm talking to people about the good good practice. I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but but, uh, but what but but one of the ways uh, one of the things that I've said said that I've observed with you, and to be honest, it's true of my some of my work and and people like Alfie, another friend of ours, um, who who's, who we both regard as uh, very highly uh, in terms of his skills, is that we could do a good job of writing code in a language that we hadn't used before. Mm -hmm. We might, we might not necessarily be perfectly idiomatic. We wouldn't necessarily, um, uh, you know, know all of the detail of the tools, but there's something else. There's some other level of design ideas going on um, that matter, that, that matter and seem more durable, more transferable. And it seems odd to me that as an industry, we so rarely talk about those kinds of things. Yeah. It, doing a few things really well is incredibly powerful. I think that's what you're saying, like to be going to the different languages, because yeah. it doesn't matter so much about the language. Like people want to learn every feature in every corner. Is it really the same? I sort of think back to my martial arts days when people wanted to know every kick and every technique and every, and it just becomes too much noise to draw on. Yeah. I had the pleasure of training with a few world champions at different stages, and they used to do just a few small number of things incredibly well. Yeah. And that yeah. seemed to be the essence of it all the time. Yeah, 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 ab ab absolutely. Um, when last we worked together, um, we did all of the final stage interviewing of mm. developers joining the team at LMAX. Um, at the time, we used to talk a lot about the design and developer skills and the kinds of things that we were seeking, looking for people to join the team. So what, what are those things? Could you, do you have a feeling? Do you have, do you have a sense of what those things are that we were looking for and that you value in the people that you admire? Yeah, I th think back at the time, I didn't totally know. Some of it was subconscious. Like over time, I've reflected more on these things. And I think I'm starting to get a handle on some of what I, I personally look for. And I think the sort of the fundamental thing would be curiosity. Mm -hmm. So people who are naturally curious, and this is very strongly linked with an interest in learning, which then sort of flips into humility. So there's a various things that all sort of link together because we are an industry that's moving all of the time. It's always reinventing. So there's some key things that are really important, like we talked about to get right, but there's a lot that's moving, a lot advancing all of the time. But if you're not curious, you're not going to keep up. You're not going to mm -hmm. learn the new things. And I think this is where the sort of humility comes in as well, in that if you go into a new area and you learn something new, by its nature, you're going backwards to go forwards. And that's something yeah. that people have to be comfortable doing. <laughs> and so some of what I started looking for was just evidence, like, trying to do everything evidential to like, get them to show some evidence of where they went through learning and watched how they did that and how they described it. So like try to get evidence of their curiosity, try to get evidence of how they were comfortable 
sort of going back to being a beginner within a topic and then moving forward again. And it's a lot of that. So I've heard the term now said about it, the growth mindset. It's mm -hmm. that sort of thinking that do people have to be sort of wired to want to go that way and not to be stuck. Because I've seen this so many times where people who are very senior often won't accept change. They won't yeah. move forward. Like I love Ken Brack's uh, sort of strap line on his famous XP book was Embrace Change. That just yes. resonated with me because that is so much what the modern world is like, not just our industry. And if you're not willing to accept, like let's go back to Darwin and Wallace. Like, yeah. it, it's all about adaptation. It's about being able to cope with the constantly changing environment. That's what matters. So you're sort of looking for that as a core. You're not looking for who has specific skills. Like I've joked to people in the past about how I did interviews around the year 2000 and slightly after that. And people will be questioning me on my knowledge of weird corners of C++ or web logic or something. You know, at one stage, I used to have fun where like I could just challenge people to ask me questions on web logic 7.3 or whatever it was. And <laughs> I kind of knew those corners of it, but it doesn't really matter. That's not yeah. what that wasn't the going between the things. And I thought it was always field interviews when people were doing that. And people say, oh, but you did really well in that. But that's just luck of circumstance. That's not the right mindset that they're testing for. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, absolutely. That, that, that resonates strongly with me. I, I, I think that the last the last programming language that I felt that I'd used every bit of it because I was trying to was C. Mm. <laughs> and I, 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 I think the last thing that I used was was, was unions in structures, <laughs> and I remember kind of ticking ticking that off and thinking, oh yeah, I've done I've done C now, <laughs> but it's meaningless. It's 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 lo absolutely yeah, yeah. ludicrous. And and very very shortly after that, I realised that it was meaningless, and then I stopped trying. And so I, I joked for a little while about being a, a reduced instruction set programmer. So, yes. so I, would... <laughs> I remember you saying that and I find myself sort of nodding in agreement. <laughs> but it's uh, it's uh, it's it's in it's interesting that the, the the focus that we tend to have on what somehow to me feels like technical ephemera that the the absolutely our industry moves quickly and things move on but the fundamentals don't seem to change very quickly at all that that that, that, that they are those sorts of changes are much um mm -hmm. less frequent and that i am as as you know but to, for the per, for the benefit of the people that might be watching this um you know i i I'm I'm suspicious of people that that think that they know it all or that are dogmatic about things because my going in assumption is that I'm, you know anything that I think is probably wrong, but I'm going to make the strongest case that I can, and then you tell me where I'm wrong, and I'll be grateful to you. You know that's yeah. that's something that's interesting. I I had a, I had a funny experience recently on the YouTube channel. I had a comment on one of my YouTube videos that just said something. I'm slightly paraphrasing, but not by much. Is that you should ignore what this man says because he's old, uh, um, uh, grumpy, and ugly. And I'm thinking, even if those things are true, and they might be, um, how does that affect whether my ideas are good or bad? You know, tell me that I'm wrong and show me the evidence that I'm wrong, and I'll be grateful to you. And that that seems much more like an engineering mindset to me, and mm -hmm. and worrying about the ways in which the things that we build might go wrong. And thinking about that, I, there's a great quote from Margaret Hamilton, uh, who led the uh, yeah. flight control systems and the Apollo program, uh, saying exactly that, that you know, she started to think of it as engineering when she realised that her primary focus was just thinking about all the ways that, um, as she described it, man-rated software uh, could go wrong and then and tried to, to, to accommodate those in the design. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's the, the, that 
that seems like an important step to me. That that what you're talking about as the curiosity and the 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 you know the the need to learn. I, I remember again when you and I were interviewing lots of people. You, you you in particular used to say all of the time, "We want the sorts of people that used to take the video recorder apart." <laughs> curious, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Does this work inside? Yeah. Another of those, another of those things that I remember from, from those days when we were looking at those things, um, both of us bemoaning the idea of straight line programming. Mm. Um, uh, and I, I still, if I'm honest, that's probably the commonest form of programming that I see. So could you explain what you what you think it is and why is it important that we do better than that? I'm going to throw it back to you. How do you see straight line programming at the moment? Because I've I've probably got twisted views on it. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 I, I think that what we both meant when we were using the phrase was that somebody kind of coming to their first imagination of um uh, of the a problem and essentially writing down a se a linear sequence of steps that solved that problem, um, rather like a knitting pattern or a recipe. Rather yeah. than rather than anything else, so that there's there's few there are few organising principles and little of that management of complexity that we were talking about earlier, yeah. um, uh, it, and that's what I think. And the problem that the the natural outcome of that style of straight line programming, it seems to me, uh, is kind of the big balls of mud that we see in clients and in production all of yeah. the time. Yeah, no, I was kind of I was playing with you a little bit to say it because one of the things that I can sort of flip it around a little bit, the thing that bothers me most in most of this is not really focusing on feedback. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what's key, you know, all of that. So the reason that people end up linear sort of approaches is because they're trying to have this like moonshot or whatever that they're never adjusting because they just set off on a path and they keep going on that path. Yeah. And uh, my view, and I think this is sort of, <coughs> this piece, I think you've written a book around this. And this is where like when I start talking to customers about things like continuous delivery and people think it's like bits of agile and it's uh, continuous integration, some tests or whatever. And I'm like, that's all incidental. It's about feedback. Yeah. Yeah, but in my own mind, I don't call it continuous delivery. It's just enabling feedback. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's a different way of looking at it. But yeah, fundamentally, yeah. it's about feedback. And there's so much that's important about feedback because like, we talked about uh, the modeling, design, everything. How do you know it's right? You <laughs> need to test it with feedback. Yeah, like, everything is about the, if we're going to go with anything with any sort of reasoning, we have to have feedback. And we'll adjust. And then it can't be a straight line because we're never right to begin with. But we want to get feedback as soon as possible, as often as possible, so we can keep correcting. And that way we can embrace the change, we can adapt to the world and go with that and go forward. And I think when we start thinking like that, it becomes a very different sort of world. And there's some really interesting twists, I think, with the whole feedback side. So let's say you're feedback cycles are really long and you get tied to an idea. Like what's gonna happen from just your personality, human nature, all that sort of stuff. So you get an idea, you culture that idea, you nurture it, you help it grow, you keep it going. And it takes a long time before you get any feedback on that idea. And then eventually you get feedback saying it's not a good idea, but you've cultured and nurtured and it's become your offspring and stuff, you can't let it go. If you get the feedback much sooner, it's so much easier to just let it go and move on and do something else. So I think feedback has to be almost first and foremost in all approaches. Otherwise, uh, absolutely. We'll end up in a straight line to nowhere. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I, I, came up with a, I came up with an analogy that I think that you'll like in my book. Uh, which is uh, we could you know let's imagine that we 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 got the problem of balancing a broom. Mm -hmm. We could decide to kind of calculate the center of mass of the broom, and we could look at the the domed uh, handle of the broom and 
precisely calculate the point at which the center of mass will go through the point of contact to perfectly balance the, the broom vertically. And, and, and there's one solution to that, and it's incredibly unstable. We've got to then you know, put balance it with just without leaving any impulse on the broom that moves it or anything like that. Mm. Or we could just put the broom on our hand and then just respond with feedback based on what happens. And, yeah. you know, if there's a big perturbation, we move, we move a long way. If there's a small one, if we make a mistake, we can correct it really quickly. Yeah. And that, that's how rockets work. <laughs> that's, 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 how, that's how you balance a rocket, you know, a, a, a spacecraft on, on, on the thrust of a rocket. This yeah. is a much dramatically more stable solution. There are, you know, m many, many more solutions, perhaps an infinite number of solutions to the problem. Uh, yeah. once you start moving rather than only one and yeah. so you know, that's a much more effective way of solving problems and yeah. uh, and just you know learning reacting and to do that you know that you, it, as soon as you start thinking of it in those sorts of terms then that you know if you're too slow you're going to have to be, make bigger moves if you make tiny moves huh. then you, you, it's, it's almost perfectly it's almost perfectly still and then, you know again that's how a rocket moves you know a computerized yeah. Um, flight control system that just balances the thrust in, in an appropriate line with tiny little corrections. Yeah. And so you think about it, what is true expertise and true specialization? Is it being really finely attuned to having very good feedback and being very sensitive to that and putting minimal input based upon that feedback so that it's incredibly efficient with what you're doing? Like, take one of the examples of a conversation. I remember we had years ago, and you said something that I think was completely unrelated to this, but it sort of struck a chord for me when we were talking about flying. And like the best pilot, because like, like most people don't know this, I'm going to chip in, Dave's actually quite a good pilot. <laughs> and at one stage, I started learning to fly little model helicopters, and so did Dave. And then watching Dave fly the model helicopters, he used a lot less input than I did because he knew how much to put in. I didn't. I put in too much, and it's like, it's, it's the classic example of very much an amateur and inexperienced person with anything is their input is not very well tuned to handling the feedback. So you put in too much input mm -hmm. that causes you to have to counteract and put lots of input the other way, but you don't know exactly how much. And so it, it all just becomes feedback cycles that become nasty rather than positive. Yeah. The same with software and with everything else is getting ourselves attuned to those feedback cycles. So Unless we work on them, we don't get better at them. It's like anything. We have to practice. We have to play. We have to get good at dealing with them. And so dealing with the feedback cycles in software is no different from the feedback cycles in learning to play a sport or do anything physical or just live our lives. Like, mm -hmm. like our personalities, everything's attuned but to how we interact with everybody else. And we should adjust and become better people, better citizens, better whatever based upon our feedback, because our friends tell us when we're young, if we're out of order, our parents yeah. do. It's like everything. And so getting comfortable with that and getting better is what really matters. The, the, the other idea that I think kind of ties in with, with, with all that we've talked about, really, for, for me uh, so far as well, is about... Um, you know, incremental development and incremental learning. So you're monitoring that feedback. You're working in these small steps and making progress. I remember one of the things that kind of started me thinking along that, that path maybe is conversations that, again, we had. Um, and you, you, you always pointed out that in, um, in, in safety critical systems, in, in, in endeavors that where people, people's lives were at risk, you know, sailing or, or aviation or those sorts of things, then the, the, the whole industry was really set up to, to learn incrementally from, from disaster. You know, the, the, mm. the, the, the safety of modern commercial aircraft is written in the blood of the people that, were, that yeah. were killed as we didn't know how to do that. And that's another facet of engineering, it, it seems to me. And, and another one of those things that um, I've come to, to, to more deeply appreciate what Kent Beck meant when he said embrace change mm. is that, you know, we want to embrace that kind of change too. So that as we learn, you know, where to put the engines on an airplane so that they're not going to, you know, 
if there's a if there's a failure, catch fire and, and transmit fire to other parts of the structure. And we move those sorts of things incrementally, bit by bit by bit. The, the systems that we get get better and better and better until uh, I, I saw a great presentation by uh, somebody who was a, a safety leader at Lufthansa. Uh, mm -hmm. And he said that in, I think it was in 2017, uh, commercial aviation moved the equivalent of two thirds of the population of the planet. Mm -hmm. And during that year, there wasn't a single fatality on a commercial aircraft, which is yeah. astonishing uh, to be able to achieve that kind of thing. But you don't do that by being really clever and imagining all, you know, imagining a perfect solution from day one. The Wright brothers were really clever, but they couldn't imagine that perfect solution until you've been through the experience and learned. So being able to incrementally embrace change and do work that allows, in a way that allows you to, that keeps the doors open to you being able to change your mind and learn new things and adapt. Yeah, and the tools, and uh, you know, I was late to the testing game and getting into that and those were some of the sort of penny drop moments for me was what testing was good for and i think the mm -hmm. name's terrible because it, it makes you think the wrong things yes but it's the it gives you the ability to get feedback it lets you have feedback on small things that have good separation of concern and yep. you can then build on solid foundations plus you get all the regression stuff and all of that which is great but it's that small incremental feedback cycles that you're going in the right way you're designing something yeah. so you're getting the interfaces right you can see how it's working now, a thing i love to remember from reading one of the steve mcguire books in the 90s and pointing out that all code you write you should step through in a debugger and how that builds stronger mental models well, what better place to be able to do that is within tests when you can look at something it just enables it it sets up the environment whereby you can do that so easy and yeah. you're, you're testing, you're getting feedback on your model. So how should something work? Does it do this yet? Does it not? Fitting in like scientific method and falsifiability. So write the test mm -hmm. first. You falsify it. The system doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, <laughs> Then exactly. see that, get the feedback that it doesn't work. Then write the yeah. code and get it working. Move forward in incremental steps. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, as, as usual, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100% on, on, on those things. That the, I, I, don't know, I don't know what would be a better name. So, so we, we had a shot at ThoughtWorks of trying to come up with behavior, something that was better named, and that's where behavior-driven development came from. But I'm not quite sure that gets it either. The, the, the thing that I value most from test-driven mm -hmm. development is the feedback that I get on the quality of my design. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that's the, and I don't. It's really, really hard to get that kind of feedback any other way that I know. Let's yeah. move the conversation on a little bit. So, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you work as a consultant, um, uh, adv advising usually big companies who you can't name, working on high performance systems that you can't describe in too much detail to help them to improve their engineering as well as the performance of their systems. So, could you describe? the way in which you start to move into that and start applying the kinds of ideas and thinking that you've just been talking about to help your customers build those better systems. What are the common problems that you see in those sorts of organizations and, and how do you help people to fix them? So I suppose it's just a step back and look at how I end up engaging with customers and sort of gives you an idea of the way in. So either someone comes with a performance issue now, they currently have a performance issue. How do they move forward? And so that's usually a quite a simple uh, approach where you go in and you've got a profile. And they usually to have profile, you need to have some tasks, some refined tasks, particularly some loaded performance tasks to do that. And you start building up a model of what the system does. And the, the, at the core of many things, it's like, what is the model of what's going on? And how do we measure that model? then how does that model fit to what it needs to be? And that's all a lot of those things happen to be. So we start measuring it and it's okay. It can do X in throughput or response times or whatever we're going to measure it. At. We're going to look for that. I, I don't like the terms where it makes something faster. It's not very helpful. <laughs> you know, yeah. How, how fast is fast? Like, so what's required? So again, this is like understanding the business state, find out what's required, find out what this thing does, What's the gap and how do we, fit, yeah. how do we close that gap and 
we're looking for costs, we're looking for inefficiencies, all of that stuff. And that's just building up the model to do that. And part of doing that, you usually end up fixing code, fixing build systems, fixing lots of other things. And people start to see, well, you don't just like know a bunch of tricks and the twiddling tricks to do so that's usually much more a whole sort of systemic approach to things because most of the really interesting performance problems are not usually a bit of bit twiddling they're mm -hmm. a systemic design flaw usually and so you want to isolate that or change an approach to doing something it may be contention based yeah. and maybe too much allocation maybe just too much cpu like you're looking for constraining resources so which resource are we overusing those sorts of things and so that's one factor in where you end up understanding a problem and helping things. And you have to touch so many different things. You start to understand the business problem and you understand how they're releasing software, how do they test in these environments, and you can improve a lot of that. And you start helping that way. And that just becomes very much a, people like seeing how you work and want you to do more. So, so, mm -hmm. so many clients I've had like that over the years have come in, started doing that, and then they've just asked me to help with everything from sort of writing tasks to fixing build processes to how they talk to their customers even, <laughs> whatever that happens to be. Whereas in many cases, the customers are very silent in these sorts of <laughs> yeah. scenarios, but it seems sort of thing. Oh, just, side. just, just, just to interrupt you for a minute. I just think it's kind of amusing. Is that I think that we come from opposite ends of the spectrum. Mostly people hire me to tell to start on the first stuff, talking about build systems and all that sort of stuff. And then later, when when, when we get talking, I, I then get into helping them with the design of their systems and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and the performance. And so we're starting at opposite opposite ends and meeting just in the middle inter somewhere. Different entry points. <laughs> Although other common entry points I get is people referring or people mm -hmm. moving people move organizations they move from one yeah. organization to another and they've had a good experience with you before and they come in and say mm -hmm. like look we need to do things better we want to go for the next generation of our product we want to go into a new market opportunity something like that and you get involved much more at the top level down so looking at the design what's possible skills of teams how do we upskill teams I, I get general things where people will say like how can you make java go so fast Mm -hmm. how can we change this sort of stuff or whatever and it, it's yeah. like the language doesn't matter as much as the design right? we yeah. started off talking about some of that so sometimes yeah. that is the entry point where we're coming in and doing top down and doing that and again it's very much systemic and uh, then you're looking at where the opportunities for doing stuff better is and simplifying designs is the way to make it fast, make it reliable, make it easy to modify, make it easy to understand. Yeah. All those things. So I think simplicity is key, but it's not easy. Yeah, it requires yeah, yeah absolutely. And reflection and feedback, and everything. and sometimes you can end up with this really beautiful, elegant decision or solution. It takes iteration, takes time and thinking to get out there. Yeah. So, so, so just, there's there's a couple of threads in there I'd like to. To, to 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 pick up on so 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 the, the the simplicity thing I think is is key and and as CTO at LMAX that was one of the things that you instilled in in all of the technical people that worked there that you know if uh, if the solution wasn't simple we haven't got it yet <laughs> which 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 was a great guideline for people I think yeah um, and uh, and steered us in the in in good directions the other thing that I'd like to just kind of pull mm. back pull back to a little bit that you were talking about is you, you mentioned modeling and my guess is that some people watching this will have a different thing in mind to what I think you mean when mm. you're talking about modeling so could you elaborate on that a little bit because I know that I know that you believe that modeling is important to the approach as I do to yeah. the approach but we don't mean something formal and you know specific diagramming technique or any of those sorts of things yeah I at a high level, I sort of think of modeling as how to build a view of something, so an understanding. Mm -hmm. And modeling can be mean many things to many people, as you say. But if you want to do something, like what is the <coughs> problem you're trying to solve? And what is the solution that fits into a space mm -hmm. that solves that, that problem that's there? And so you're providing that. And you can call that a model at the end of the day. So yeah. and it's an understanding of what it needs to be. So what are the entities in this system, how they're all going to interact and coming up with that to solve that purpose? Yeah. There's a lot of techniques to doing that. 
but mostly it's about how do we reason through the space? How do we build that mental model that fits her? Sometimes you use paper, sometimes you use tests, sometimes you just chalk on a whiteboard, sometimes you go for a walk and just mull it yeah, over. Yeah. But you're trying to come up with something that's a good reflection of what the solution needs to be. Well, what one of one of the things that I've I've observed in your approach to design, uh, uh, you know, I, I suppose it's corollary corollary of the separation of the th of concerns thing, but um, you're very good at um, designing systems that separate the essential complexity from the accidental complexity of a system, and that seems to me fairly important uh, uh, very often. It's understanding what you need to do and because it kind of coming a little bit back to almost that humility and admitting that we are not great as humans at dealing mm -hmm. with lots of complex. We, we deal with some quite spectacular things, but only if we can get the right levels of abstraction in place, the right rules, the right protocols. Protocols yes. are particularly important. So the separation of concerns is really important for having individual components that do one thing, do it really well. Then mm -hmm. how do they interact? To achieve some greater goal yeah and i find that very few people are good at separating what are the protocols of interaction from what are the individual components that's all very blurred to people yeah for me the, those are two very distinct things and that's what allows scale to occur in design particularly I, I, go, go I, ahead. I, I i had i had a good a good conversation with a mutual friend of ours a, a few mm. weeks ago. I was, I was chatting with Eric Evans uh, and we were talking about uh, some aspects of design. We got onto the topic of microservices and he said something that resonated with me, into, it, which, which I, th I think he's saying in different language, the, the same kind of thing that I've heard you say about talking about the protocols of, you mm. know, uh, of the exchange of information between parts of the system, modules of the system, um, which is that, um, this, there are um, separate bounded contexts in those protocols. They're not part of the same bounded context. So he said it's a, it's a separate bounded context. I, I'll kind of refine that slightly in terms of it's a collection of separate bounded contexts of different mm -hmm. conversations. But I thought it was a nice idea in terms of, you know, um, creating that hierarchy in the design. You've got to figure out, you know, what makes sensible boundaries in terms of the modular limits yeah. of your system and then you've got to think about the conversations between them the protocols of exchange of information between the parts and that's a separate part of the problem and then maybe there's kind of at the top level there's kind of some kind of you know correlation ideas that allow you to stitch the conversations together yeah no i think very important and it, it, it's existed for a long time in many different fields yeah yeah it's why the human race has scaled why anything else is like well, how does an old colony reach what it is able to achieve it's through the protocols that they follow very simple yes. I think the, the, the big failure i often see is as technologists we try for perfection in protocols <laughs> we yes. don't embrace that failure is a natural thing yes like imperfections and what's more important is have a protocol that deals with imperfections rather than trying to and you see this with like top-down control or personalities and things i think conway's law is so true for how much software is written <coughs> i think if you want the team to build software in a certain way focus on how the team works together because mm -hmm. the software ends up reflecting you know we focused on this a lot when we've worked together in the past it yep. really matters because if things are well decoupled with good levels of autonomy having the appropriate resources, the appropriate information to do what it needs to do. So, so it's a bit like this sort of uh, tell, don't ask type principles. It's like you say exactly what's required and the, the other part of the system has everything it needs to carry out that role. That's partly protocol design. Yes. And sort of getting that at a higher level. And we kind of miss that because that gives us also really good decoupling because you're not saying mm -hmm. how it's done. Again, this yes. is fits with information hiding all of that sort of side. And I, I see this really often in that people can often quote principles or quote whatever, but they can't demonstrate them. And yes. The code doesn't demonstrate it. And that's where like, that's the things we need to practice on because we only get good at making that second nature by consciously practicing. I think in yes. any field in human history, we only get good at it by practice and play. 
yes. but it has to be conscious and deliberate practice yes. and be aware of what we're dealing with. And I think protocols are a big step forward in that. And so like the move to microservices, even distributed systems, people wanting to do that without spending any time thinking about the protocols. It, yes. You can start doing it informally, but at least even do it informally. Start asking yes. about what if things happen in different orders? What if it goes wrong? What if a message isn't delivered? What if it's delivered twice? What if things appear that are contradictory? How do you deal with those things? And that, that should be the discussion around the protocol so that you can cope in all those scenarios. Then the implementation of those internal components, it becomes a much more isolated and scaled thing. So like, how do we scale a team to build a complex system? Now we talk about people being architects, people being senior, whatever in our project. The people who are senior need to focus on the protocols because otherwise, yeah. how can the teams build something that works together at scale and have any confidence in it? Yeah. And that, that's, that's the key to that is thinking about how it works. Uh, there's a, a brilliant example from Sully Floyd on how we design uh, multicast network systems where you get loss that can happen in a network. And whenever a loss happens, how do we cope at scale and not have single points of failure? And what I love about some of her work is she was originally a, a sociologist who then become a computer scientist. And you can see in her algorithms the influence from sociology in the past. Yeah. And so I've used this one example a few times in public before because I just love the, the essence of this algorithm. So it's the basic problem. So. If you're in a network and you've got multiple receivers of data over a multicast protocol, that data can get lost. If it gets lost, it needs to be retransmitted. And so we start working that way. So the sender sends some data, multiple receivers are gonna get it. Like one or more of the receivers may not get that data. Their responsibility is to re-request the data to have it retransmitted so they've got a full view. And this is the same as in, in the normal world. Now imagine if the number of receivers starts to become relatively high and even hundreds or thousands at this stage, that starts to become a serious problem. So if you get loss and the loss is often correlated with loss happening at the producer point, that means many or maybe even all receivers do not get the data. So imagine if they all ask for a re-request of that data Mm -hmm. You're just going to get an implosion of the network as if they all re requested and it all gets sent again. It just it's doesn't, yeah, it doesn't scale. And you see, people will approach that problem and go, Do what we need. We need command and control. We need someone yeah. to stand on a fence and tell everybody what to do. <laughs> she did not take any approach like that. Mm -hmm. She fell back on math and collaboration and scale. And yeah. so, simple approach that she took was to say, okay, well, if we get loss, let's acknowledge that we've got loss, but don't ask straight away. Yeah. Let's wait for a little period of time. So we'll set a random timer and you set the function of how long you're on any time based upon the round trip time of the communication. And all of the receivers are doing the same thing with their own random timer. And they're all gonna go off at different points in the future because it's random. Yeah. By doing that, one will happen before the others and some will happen later. So the first one that wakes up when it's random timer goes off and it goes, has this data been retransmitted? No. Okay, I'll ask for it. So it asks for the data, it gets retransmitted because it's multicast, it goes to all of the receivers at that point. Then as yeah. the other random timers go off requesting the data, I've already got it. I don't need to ask. Yeah. Brilliantly scalable. Yeah. No single points of failure and works beautifully. In reality, I, I've got to work on systems that implement these types of algorithms and they work yeah. so well. But some people will go, oh, but how can you be sure that one of them will send this? Like, you need to get over it. <laughs> yeah. Nature is probabilistic. <laughs> yeah. Failures happen and just deal with it. And it's changing to that line of thinking is what yeah. really helps things scale and that's how things function. I, I, I've, fun, funnily enough, first of all, is that I, I did uh, I did a video on on my YouTube channel um, 
uh, on that topic. I, um, uh, Facebook had a, a, another outage a few years ago, yeah. um, which was exactly because of that problem. Uh, they had a, a loss, uh, 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 they had a problem, and then all of the nodes went back to, they dumped a cache, that, uh, and then yeah. all of the nodes went back to repopulate the cache, and then overloaded the, the, the central repository with, that was the truth for the cache, and the yeah. whole system just kind of fell over on it. You know, on its side um so, so the the idea of adding hysteresis and all those sorts of things but, but that's one of those kinds of ideas that is is sort of a, 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 you know old in computer science you know it's a you know comes from control theory and those sorts mm -hmm. of things and and one of the things that, that as a you know as a, a grumpy old man i'm observing increasingly is that our stuff is less about computers and more and more just about the information it's just it's just yeah. as true of of non-computer based systems as it is of computer systems it's that the computers are just another facet of dealing with information that they they amplify it up and they speed things up and they they do things yeah. at, at bigger volumes but they're the same classes of problems very much i i remember another friend of ours andy uh, andy stewart talking about uh, when we first talked about the disruptor saying that's what data, you know, that, that's how you do it with databases. <laughs> you know, ah, okay. And we were talking about optimizing, the, you know, the thread controlling processes and things. It was, it was amusing things, but, but the, these ideas are, are, are very, very closely related very often. Yeah. And go to the teams as well, because they're all yes. just systems. Yes, the, the, they're information they're systems too. Yeah. yeah, the team is a system. So I go, how do you make a team more efficient? You profile it. And yeah. not in the, the whole sort of old Taylorism and we'll all keep time on people, just actually having sensible conversations, seeing where people are having their time, <laughs> but not having that sort of blame based culture, but looking at uh, how do we get better? Like, think about whenever we work together, like what was slowing people down? Like, it's making sure they've got all of the right information so they can make good decisions. You make sure they've got that. But building software was slow, especially yeah. when you get loads and loads of tasks. So, what do we do? We yep. buy really good purring stations that can run tasks really fast because that's yep. what matters. It becomes the bottleneck. Yeah, absolutely. You, you fight for those things. And I think uh, this is what I see quite often and why some organizations do better than others is we also need representation at board level of yep. people who understand technology. So like a, I will fight at board level to make sure people have the right kit and the right information to do that. So I, I think one of my biggest jobs at LMAC was not writing code. It was getting what the team needed to deliver code well. And that's what we yep. have. And that's just this, that's just a, a systems a thinking problem. We look at it, what's slowing down the team? What do they need? Yep. How did they do it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, 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 so moving on slightly, what once more, you know, we, we, we got we got a little while to go, a little bit more time yeah I, I hope um so so you're, you're a high performance computing expert and one of the ideas that I, th I think occurred to you while we were working at LMAX was the idea of mechanical sympathy so sort of taking mm -hmm. it from Jackie Stewart the racing car driver and applying it to software could you describe your what you see as mechanical sympathy and um I'm particularly interested in how you see it affecting software more generally than just in the esoteric cutting edge world of finance and high performance systems yeah so, so let's look at what jackie stewart actually said when back when he was the best racing driver in the world at the time he was the three-time world champion and particularly he was stunningly good whenever it was wet or difficult conditions and his whole thinking around this was to be a great racing driver you had to have a sufficient level of understanding of your vehicle to get the best out of it he was a mechanic by background before he became a driver and a few of that era were and they mm -hmm. stood out to the others and so particularly things like the physics around the vehicles themselves and that's why he did really well in the wet he understood about how tires break traction whenever the roads wet and not just at a sort of instinctive level but really understood the mechanics of it and he knew how to push in the importance of smoothness and 
when you know that, then how do you feed back into the system to get good at it? So like for one of the examples, if you go to the Jackie Stewart Racing School, is there's a ball on the front of the car and you drive the car and he puts a tennis ball in the middle of the ball and he gets you to drive as fast as possible without the ball coming out of the ball because smoothness is what matters. It's down to that thing we were talking about earlier is don't put too much input in, just the right amount of input and refine those sorts of skills. Mm -hmm. With software, I think it's the same thing. Like we're writing software that's making use of the underlying hardware. And it's not just hardware, but the operating systems, the platforms, the runtimes that we're on. We want to work with them, not against them. Mm -hmm. like they're written assuming software to work in a certain way. So we know what assumptions they're making and we work with them. We can get the best out of them. And again, yes. see, this is down to protocols of interaction. It's collaboration. It's understanding what is the expected interaction and doing it. So in some ways, people say, well, you need to understand really detailed implementation. That's interesting and fascinating and fits the whole curiosity thing. Mm -hmm. But it's not the most important point. The point is, what is it expecting? And what is the way it's expected to be used? And you use it in that way. And it, it's about respect. So mm -hmm. just showing a respectful interaction for the hardware. Like I kind of like to joke that sort of come the singularity and uh, if humans are going to be wiped out, I'm hoping I'm going to be kept as a pet because maybe I've been nicer <laughs> to some of the computers <laughs> than some other people. I haven't been <laughs> processed too much. Uh, JSON and XML and YAML and uh... <laughs> yeah, so I like that. Kept... I, I like that. I mean, having had conversations with you when we were both drunk, I, I think you're in with this shot. <laughs> <laughs> Is that any different from how we should interact with the customer? Like understand, understanding what matters to them, having sympathy. Well, actually yeah. having empathy. I think the term is incorrect. It's not about mechanical sympathy. It's about mechanical, mechanical empathy, empathy. But yeah. it's what Jackie Stewart originally coined in a <coughs> the same term and stuff. Mm. I think it's really important. I, I, I quite like the thing about the uh, the bowl with the, the, the tennis ball on, on, on the bonnet because that feels like quite a good analogy for it's not about that's part of the problem with you talking about um, a mechanical sympathy is that you have a, an encyclopedia knowledge of how processes work and all of the hardware and all that kind of stuff. And so you can kind of talk about all of those things. You don't need quite that level of detail to make use of it, though. So, so that you can have sort of the, the, the bowl on the bonnet with a ball in it as guide rails that because somebody understands well what's really needed, you can use a simpler model to work against to, to, to get similar results, you know, to, to similar, better aligned results. Yeah, so, in the, so if you don't talk memory, for example, and CPUs, yeah. you need to know three rules. One is respect locality of reference. Keep things yeah. that are used together, together. Yeah. Cohesion. Yeah. Again, Yay. it's not breaking the design principle. <laughs> It's if you're going to use things together and you're going to use them in time or get, put them together in time so you've got a temporal side to it because that's yep. another thing of caches is something's in a cache. If you get to use it again soon, you get the benefit yep. from it. So you have a nice temporal cohesion around the appropriate things. So yep. work on the same things for a period of time, then move on and work on something else. Funny, humans work well like that too. Yes. <laughs> and then the other thing is be predictable because... The memory wants to help you. It's nice. It wants to be your friend. It wants to give it to you when you need it. But if you don't help it, if you don't do things in a predictable way, if you're random and yeah. difficult to it, it can't help you, just like your friends can't help you and stuff. So again, it's down to this that empathy. Now, that doesn't require you to know a lot about how memory works. But those are the rules. Those are the abstractions. And this is where we use abstraction very wrongly and uh, Joel's supposedly coming up with this yes. term about leaky abstractions because it's not a true abstraction like, yep. that's all we need to know about memory from an abstraction point of view now you can go to the next level of detail and go like what are the sizes and times or not but it's still it's fitting just a bit more detail you still don't need to go down to how it actually works that's just kind of interesting to how it fulfills those abstractions but yeah and that's for people who want to work on them I knew there was a reason why I liked you. Just give me another reason to 
to push my book. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 in the in the in the in the chapter on on abstraction, I, I, I talk about the leaky abstractions and all that sort of thing. It seems to me that that's just about you know the problem with models. You know, all all yeah. models are wrong. Some models are useful. The, mm -hmm. the leakiness of an abstraction doesn't matter as long as you use the model within the right constraints. The you know the model you know a, you can you can have two different kinds of map. You can have you know a a a, a chart, an aviation or navigation chart where you you've got yeah. rum lines where you can kind of lines you know lines on the map are of constant bearing. Those mm -hmm. sorts of things which don't work on a sphere, but they'll navigate they'll get you to the right place if you navigate that way. And you can have things like a tube map, the way the topology is modeled accurately, mm -hmm. but geography is not. They're both useful abstractions. They, they would both leak if you use them in the wrong context, but you don't use them in the wrong context because they're models. And, exactly. and I think we, mi we miss those kinds of things very often. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's move on again. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'm sorry to the viewers. I'm, I'm coughing and spluttering. I, I'm recovering from a cold. Um, so while we were working together at LMAX, we kind of came up with a pretty innovative approach, at least to us, I, I think, in terms of the architecture of the system and, and architecture of high performance systems to some extent. Um, and later, you, you and I got involved in writing something called the Reactive Manifesto. Could you de describe where you're at now in terms of your thinking about reactive systems and their place in the world? Do you still think that's a good thing, a, 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 a useful idea for people to explore and, and follow? Yeah, I think there's... And, and, and it might lead you into talking about Aeron and your, your, your world-class messaging system. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's sort of two linked, but not totally align things so yeah on the reactive manifesto and the, the principles i think are important because they respect a lot of what matters like systems being responsive it matters so much so we're not talking about absolute performance but being responsive enough again this comes down to the feedback thing. yeah like systems are more profitable that are used by customers that are responsive because they can yeah. better do their job but responsiveness goes much further than just the raw single transaction performance. It's like if it's down for periods of time, so like, can you work 24 seven? You're not available, you're not responsive. Mm -hmm. So having some of those principles there are, are important. Same as like just being resilient so how we cope with failure and change. And again, this is down to some of the protocol work. Like how many systems have we've seen that just catastrophically fail when certain error conditions occur? They're not resilient. They're not kind of building that way. But the sort of the drift into a little bit of what we did before and what matters, and actually tie it back to some of what we discussed. Like I said, separation of concerns is such an important thing for me. Now, if we're working on a business problem in a, in a given domain for a customer, do we care about technology? I think you and I really yep. despise the idea that technology is in the middle of that yes it should be as clean as possible very few technologies allow us to do that yes the technologies deliberately inject themselves into what's going on and it's quite deliberate it's because of what the motivations are like the, the big companies that produce software products that want us tied to those software products you, you do that by coupling so strongly. So they deliberately drive some of the wrong coupling. And it's understandable yeah. from a commercial perspective. I don't like it, but we deal with it. What we've been doing with some of the work at Aeron. So at one level, we have been working on messaging. So there's the Aeron transport, which is really low latency, high throughput messaging. That we want to kind of leave to the side because that's great for a certain domain. It's great for what you want. The extremes of performance or you want to really drive for efficiency shifting large volumes of data most people don't need that they may benefit mm -hmm. from some of the efficiency but they don't need that some people want to record large volumes to disk and do that efficiently so that's kind of the next step up on that and when we worked on archive that become a fundamental driver so like so can we keep a history of what's going on again that's an, again an interesting space for me the real difference to what we were able to do at LMAX. And I think we've, we've gone much further now with our own cluster is the mm -hmm. ability to run a domain model hosted inside a container that can be fault tolerant. So we can be resilient to faults and the system can keep going 
It can be running 24 seven and doing upgrades, but having this all really responsive and not tied to the underlying technology. So mm -hmm. having a model which describes a business problem that has nothing in it other than the base programming language itself and some data structures to represent the relationships. Like yeah, and it's single threaded. <laughs> it makes it so easy to reason and deal with and test and all of that other good stuff because you've got that really strongly decoupled model from everything else with so the clear separation of concerns and work on that. But then having the ability for that to run being incredibly responsive and nodes just die and you just mm -hmm. continue on and go. Like yeah. you and I have seen this, like the whole people working on the sort of primary, secondary, and if one node dies, somebody manually has to get involved. Like it should just be a case of a node dies. We have an algorithm elect a new leader in this, and it just continues. And these are the sort of nice systems that we're now been able to offer to people so to work on these pure domain models that can be hosted really responsive and resilient in these sorts of environments. And that's what's really sort of getting me out of bed most days to build those sorts of things. Like they fit incredibly well for like financial exchanges and risk systems, surveillance systems, and certainly why they fit very well, they've got extreme performance requirements and they've also got very rich domain models to work on. So that's kind of nice, but it is starting to be used in a number of other places. It's becoming mm -hmm. quite interesting, especially as people are redeveloping and stuff and so some of the stuff that we can hopefully be announcing in the next year or so is we have signed up some of the world's largest reserve banks and mm -hmm. at least one of them has said they will allow us to talk about it publicly after they go live where like, this is core infrastructure that the world depends on for moving money but they want to be up 24 7 they want to be really responsive they don't want these systems to be slow like we know how fast these systems can be and yet yep. how much do we see is just painfully slow. And the reason it's painfully slow is it's carrying all of this baggage of things yeah. that just isn't required. And yet yeah. we roll the stuff out into all the systems we build. And like, they think about it, I don't have that big a brain to fit all of the stuff that people put into certain projects and still have enough capacity left to think about how do I do a good job on solving this domain problem and coming up with an elegant solution? I, th I think that any primary thing. I think that anybody that's been on the wrong side of a technical debate with you will argue that you do have a, a big brain. <laughs> but, 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 but I do agree with you, and I always think it's one of your nicest characteristics that you're very modest. <laughs> so I, 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 agree, I agree entirely, of course. The, the other aspect of these kinds of systems that I probably care about more than the performance in, ma in many respects is that the programming model is, is naturally simpler mm. uh, it, it, because the ex accidental complexity is moved to the edges of the system and smart people like you and your team can, can kind of provide a lot of that, 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 that cleverness in the accidental complexity. It allows less big brain people like me to be able to focus on the, uh, the essential complexity of the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I, th I think that's, uh, I think that's a very nice characteristic of these kinds of systems. Yeah. I think we're probably out of time in, in terms of the time that you've very kindly given us today. I, I'd like to thank you. I, 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 I hope our viewers will have enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed chatting with you. And I, I hope you've had a good time too. I, I think it's really nice. It's, this reminds me of the, the, the lunchtime conversations and occasional pub conversations that we used to have uh, when we worked together about kind of trying to put the world to rights. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been a great deal of fun. And, and thanks again for, uh, for coming and talking to us today, Martin. Always a pleasure, Dave, and great to catch up with you. <laughs> Great. Uh, I, 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 will, I will definitely buy you a beer next time I see you to say thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Right. Thanks. Bye. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, thank you very much for watching uh, today. If you do have any comments on any of the ideas that we've explored here, do take a look, do, 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 do add them into, into, the, into the comments section. Um, thank you very much for watching.